Hey everybody, I'm just testing the audio level. And, uh, today we're going to um, review logic and we're going to uh, continue learning a few different ways to prove things with proof tables. And hopefully we'll get to the idea of introducing our formal proof um, because writing truth table proofs um, while it's relatively straightforward, can get to be extremely long. Um, does anybody know why that is? So how many rows do we have in a truth table when we have two variables? We have four. What would happen if you have three variables? Eight, and then if we have four? Sixteen, and then five is 32, and six is 64. Does anyone want to make a truth table with 64 rows? No. So when we want to make more complex statements and prove them, we have to come up with some other methods. So what we do is we prove some rules that we call axioms, and we use them uh, to combine statements that we know are true together and then uh, can derive more complex things without having to have uh, very large truth tables. And we're mostly going to use the process of inference. So today it's really important that we learn about implication, and we will do that. Um, but let me just uh, address a couple of things first. Um, thank you so much for using Piazza uh, to ask your questions so far. Um, I just want to note that uh, we do have an office hours calendar on Moodle and Piazza. So rather than have like a fixed set of hours, every TA sets their hours, which are mostly fixed. But we do have a calendar just in case they need to change them and let you know. So anytime you want to do office hours, just take a look at the calendar and you can find out when you can go. There were a few questions on Piazza. Uh, I think I made a cut and paste error on uh, the syllabus for, um, for the final exam. So it is on Tuesday, December 17th from 1 to 4. Um, that is the last day of finals, the last possible time, I believe. Um, someone posted that they couldn't get the handouts, like the packet and um, some of the other links on Moodle. Uh, we believe we fixed that. If we haven't, please do make a post and let us know uh, what, what you're actually experiencing, and we will uh, we'll try to replicate it. But we haven't been able to replicate it ourselves. So what we did is we uploaded all the documents into Moodle directly, so they're not linking anywhere else. Um, so you shouldn't actually have that problem anymore, but let us know if you do. Um, we may not have done that in both Moodle sections. So I'm handling this class and the other discrete math class, and we have two separate Moodles for them. I think I will merge them, probably, um, so that we don't have uh, trouble making sure they're all the same. Um, some people were asking questions about how to do problems on the pre-core skills test. And if you remember in class, I uh, was letting you know that actually those questions were randomly selected from future homeworks, and we don't expect you to know how to do them. It was simply log in and practice using WebAssign. And I appreciate it. A lot of you actually did try them and got really good scores. Um, so good job on that. And I, if you actually made a better than 109, so if you made 110 points or more, I've already invited you that if you do homework one and two early, you can start being a peer tutor early. So um, you should have an email from me if you did make that high of a score on the free core skills test. Um, if you can't see your class on WebAssign, uh, make sure you have an access code and make sure you're also logging in um, to NC State. So we did have an issue with uh, a transfer student who was logged in at their, from their old school and couldn't see this class. So Make sure you type NCSU in um, because there's web assignment at different schools, and if you don't log into the right one, it won't put your class up. All right. If you want more submissions, uh, you need to go to the extension request form on WebAssign. I know it's not um, intuitive that if you don't actually want an extension and you only want some more submissions, you still have to go to the extension request because that's where you ask for more submissions too. Um, don't send me an email for that. I'll answer it, but it's much more likely that myself or a TA can answer it quickly if you do uh, actually just go to WebAssign and put the extension request on there. Um, we do check it on a quite regular basis, and you'll probably have an extension you know, within an hour of asking for it. Um, oh, and uh, if you haven't been on Piazza yet, you should. Uh, the average response time so far is nine minutes. So. Not a lot of questions posted, but about maybe 10. And they've been answered in an average of nine minutes. So if you have a question, or if you just want to see what other people are talking about, check it out. Um, so I'm very happy about that, because also 
we are trying to monitor it on a regular basis, and if you're having any trouble, we'll be trying to fix anything that uh, you're coming running into that might be a problem. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is review what we talked about last time. And we started uh, talking about logic. We talked about propositions and or not. Uh, we're going to do a little bit more with not today because we didn't do too much last time. Um, we did talk about truth tables, that they list all possible cases of combinations of your variables. Um, those cases are like snapshots of the universe, the relevant part of the universe that we want to talk about for a particular problem. And one of those snapshots exists on each row. And this is um, what we did was truth tables with two variables, each of them with true false values, which we represent with zeros and ones. And the reason why we had four cases for these combinations is because each time P is false, Q can be false or true. And then whenever P is true, Q could be false or true. So that makes four different cases. Um, and that's how we get that if we have another variable, then for all of these combinations, we have to allow for a third variable to be false. And the same thing for all of those, we have to allow for the third variable to be true. So that would be eight cases. So we multiply by two every time we add another variable that has two values. If I was writing a truth table and I added a variable that has three possible values, so I have P and Q, they have two possible values. Let's say I added R and it has three values. How many rows would I have in a truth table then? It would be 12 because it would be all of these for the first value, all of these for the second value, and all of these for the third value. So I have to multiply this 4 by 3, uh, and we'll have 12. And we'll talk about that more in class uh, later when we do actually counting. Um, and we're going to count lots of stuff. Sorry, I didn't realize you couldn't see that part. There we go. Okay, so... Um, or was one of the uh, logical operators that we looked at. And remember that three out of the four values in the output are true. So we denote it with something that looks like a V. And um, we talked about the fact that it's true when P is true or when Q is true or both. OK, for not. Not takes whatever the input variable is and negates it. So if we have p is 0 or 1, then not p is going to be the opposite. Wherever p is 0, not p is going to be 1. Sorry, let me just make new ones for those. Um, I wrote some extra stuff on there. Okay, we also talked about and, and how many truth, how many times is and true out of the four? It's only true once, and which row is it? The last row. Okay, and last time we also talked about um, other rows of the truth table. Um, where we actually might add the two variables together and get other functions that have ones in different positions. So let's make a column for not P and a column for not Q. So fill that out in your table to make sure you know how to do not P and not Q. Okay, that should be easy. I should simply be looking row by row. So remember that everything we do with the table is each snapshot in time is one row of the table. So one row doesn't have anything to do with what another row is. Um, so in this first one, first row, when P is false, then not P is going to be true. So we're only looking at one row at a time comparing values. So Q goes to 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay. And what happens if I end not P with not Q? That would be this column with this column, the not P column with the not Q column. I do row by row. 1 and 1 gives me 1. 1 and 0 gives me what? 0. And anytime I have a 0 with an and, I preserve a 0. So and 
preserves zeros. And what mathematical operator, what mathematical operator preserves zeros? Multiplication also does that. So you can also think of multiplication in binary as being very similar to AND. So it's going to work a very similar way. How about if I do not P and Q? What will I have in the first row? So I have to look at not P and look at Q and add those two together. I have a zero for Q, so I'm going to get a zero in the result. For not P, I have a one, and for Q, I have a one in the second row. And in the third row, I have two zeros, and in the fourth row, I have a zero, so I preserve it. Okay? So we're doing all the combinations. Since we have four values, there could be four different ways to write n's in between, between p's and q's if we allow negation of the variables. So we can also have p and not q. And if we look at p, it's false in the two first rows. And then I look at not q. In the last two, I'm going to have a 1 for p and a 1 for not q, so I get a 1. And in the last row, I get a zero. OK, so now I have four different functions that are output functions created using AND and my two variables and a NOT. Does anybody see anything interesting about them? There's a 1 in each column, right, for each of those outputs. Why is that useful? I can combine them to make new things, right? If I or any pair of them, how many 1s will I have in the resulting column? 2. I'll have exactly 2 because none of them overlap. And ors preserves 1s, like the opposite of and. So ORs, ANDs preserve zeros, and ORs preserve ones. So if I take any two of these columns and OR them together, I'm going to get a column with two ones in it. And any output function that has two ones in it, I should be able to get it by ORing two of these, right? Because these are all the possible rows. So if I need a one in any row, I just pick the one that has that. And then if I need a one in another row, I pick the one that has that. What if I have an output function that has three ones in it? I can just OR three of them together. Now, OR is a binary operation, so I don't really OR three things. How would you OR three things if you had to? You OR the first two and then the third one. Um, it is uh, commutative and associative, OR is, so it doesn't matter what order you do them in. OK, so why do we do that? So let me actually just point out um, looking back again on our truth table, that this first function we wrote was not p and not q. It has a 1 in the first row. That is the row where p is false and q is false. If you read this in English, though, that says p is false and q is false. It's an amazing coincidence. Another one of my bad jokes, in case you didn't know. So each row is actually written the way that, like, whatever it represents. So um, it represents the state of the universe when p is false and q is false. So in the second row, what's the function for that one? p is false and q is true. In the third one, we have p is true and q is false. And in the first, fourth one, we have p is true and q is true. So those are the four functions that we wrote. And we can make anything we want out of those. Okay, so let's actually do that. So here is a function, and DNF is disjunct, it means disjunctive normal form, 
And that's actually the fancy name for ordering together all these four functions that we made with ants. So disjunctive means or, so you don't need to worry about it. But out of those four functions that we wrote on your paper, so you have one, two, three, and four, how would you or them together to get this? So try it on your paper. Figure out which functions you would or together to get f. So we made four functions on the past one. So I'll write down what they are. Now I want you to show your neighbor what you came up with for the functions you need to or together and see if you got the same thing. Okay, so um, did anybody have any uh, questions about this or trouble or objections or anything? Yes? It's way, too complicated. it's way too complicated. Well, when you're first learning something, you have to have simple I examples. I don't mean that. Yes. Than yes. We are doing this for a purpose. We're doing this for a purpose. So, yes, it's way too complicated. So what is the function that this function actually is? It is P implies Q. It is also what? Q or not P. That is correct. So those are the two simplest other representations for this function. Does anybody know why we are creating f with this funky form? So uh, one answer over here is because we can then factor it out into a simpler form. Because sometimes our brains don't instantly recognize that there's an easier solution for something. And we need to have a method as engineers, people give us problems to solve, like build me a circuit that has this output function. And if you don't look at it and just amazingly turn it into something simple, you need to have a process that you can take that output function and transform it into something that you know will work. And then you can apply some methods to reduce it and make it shorter if you need to. But sometimes, I'm just going to tell you, I want you to write it this way. So. Um, that's the first thing, is that you need to just be able to write it this way. Now, what four, which ones did you or together? Did you put one in it? Raise your hand if you have one in your statement. Okay? Raise your hand if you don't have one in your statement. Okay? Why do you have one in your statement? Because there's a one in this row, right? So this function, not P and not Q, will always give me a one in row one. And I need a 1 there, so therefore I have it. So how many of you have a 2 in your function? Good. How many of you have a 3 in your function? A couple of you should not have 3s. So why should you not have a 3? There's a 0 here, so I don't want my function to be true. Yes. Um, you could put and not 3 in there. Um, yes, that is a great idea. So another way to do this is not three, but I ask you to or them together, but that's a great idea. So that is awesome. So how many of you have four in your expression? Okay, good. So you got it right. So it was one or two or four. Okay? Now the reason why we're doing this is because homework one, problem number one, is you're going to be given all of the 16 possible output functions, and you need to generate a function in disjunctive normal form for each of them. So you actually have to take these four functions and combine them with ORs for every one of the columns in the table. Okay? There's only one, there is only one output function that you cannot make this way. Does anybody know what it is? All zeros. So all zeros I can't make by ORing things that have ones in them together, right? Because ORs have Preserve ones, so if I have any ones at all, I'm going to save them and keep them till the end. So I can't use this form to get the uh, all zero function, which is called contradiction. And on your homework, we actually give you that function, which is, can anybody think of a simple way to get a contradiction? P and not P. So that is our simplest representation of all zero function is a variable anded 
with its opposite. Because in logic, they can't happen at the same time. Can things be true and not true in the real world? This is the difference between engineers and people who are studying to be engineers, but know that there's some other stuff on the planet. Okay, so <laughs> engineers say, no, they can't be. That's the ideal world, right? Um, in the real world, yes, people, things can be fuzzy, and they can go back in between, back and forth. But um, we're always going to assume that things work the way we want because we're not doing labs. Okay? If we did labs, it would be a different story, and you'd have a lot more torture than you already did. Okay, so why do we do that? Because we might be given a random function and uh, have to generate it, and you will be given several and have to do that. And we are going to do some simplification exercises uh, later, not yet, because we need to do an introduction to some other things. So we're going to look at implication next, which is the function that we just did, because it is the fundamental core of all artificial intelligence. And I, I haven't uh, actually never taught a general AI class, so you know someone might argue with me, but I am an AI researcher, and I would argue that uh, a lot of our reasoning systems uh, actually are based on the idea of inference. So this is written and read as p implies q, or if p, then q. And we call the first variable the hypothesis. And we call the second one the conclusion. It always has a truth function like this. And as soon as we start talking about it in English, you probably won't like it. Nobody does. This is the hardest truth table thing we will do. Okay? Well, we'll do longer truth tables and more complicated, but the ones that are hardest to remember and do correctly are these. All right, so let's talk about why P implies Q is true where it is. So let me give you an example. So my example is P is going to be the moon is made of cheese. And Q is Dr. Barnes is going to give you million dollars. Okay? You'd really like that one, right? Q is always false, right? Because I don't even have a million dollars. But um, if I had it, a million dollars, we're going to talk about what happens with P implies Q. Now, if I tell you, if P then Q, that means if the mood is made of green cheese, then Dr. Barnes is going to give you a million dollars. Now, when is the statement true? Which rows of the truth table make the statement, if the moon is made of green cheese, then Dr. Barnes will give you a million dollars? Well, the last one is obviously true, right? Because the moon is made of green cheese, and Dr. Barnes gave out the million dollars, so therefore the if-then statement is true. So that's an easy case. We're, we're good with that one, all right? Now, the first one is kind of everybody is happy with that, right? Because I haven't lied to you if I say, if the moon is made of green cheese, if it's not made of green cheese, which it's not, and I don't give you a million dollars, I haven't lied, right? It's not a lie. It's tricky and sneaky, but it's not a lie. And you can't sue anybody if you get that kind of contract, right? So if you get that kind of contract, like, you know, if you give me a Maserati, I will do X. You don't give them a Maserati, you cannot sue them, right? Okay, so you can't sue anybody for this one. This one's everybody's doing okay with that. Okay, the second one is if the moon is made of green cheese, I'll give you a million dollars, but I give you a million dollars. Are you going to sue me? No. Is everybody okay with this one being true? All right. You don't care if the moon is made of green cheese. If you get your million bucks, who cares about the contract, right? Contracts are only for the fail cases, okay? They really are. They're only for the fail cases. So this is a fail case, right? 
if the moon were made of green cheese and I didn't give you a million dollars, and I promised you that, you would be mad, right? <laughs> I'd be out of here, according to some people. <laughs> okay? So this is the place where you sue. This is the place where the implication is false. This is where the contract is broken. The statement, if P, then Q, is false. Now, I'm going to give you a really concrete example. Everybody in here has written a program. Is that true? Yes. Raise your hand if you haven't written a program. Wow. Okay. You should probably do that. <laughs> you probably are like an electrical engineer because you don't want to write any programs, but your job will make you do it anyway. So, Anyway, um, in a program, I write statements like, if something, then do something else. I'd be really mad if my computer didn't do it, right? I'd be really mad if I said, you know, if Dr. Barnes logs in, show her this picture. And that didn't work, and instead it showed her the X-rated picture you were trying to show to everyone else, except for Dr. Barnes, right? So we want computers to do exactly what we tell them, and we want if-then to work exactly the way that we expect it to. We expect this to happen. Now, what do we expect with computers? If I write a program that says if, you know, Dr. Barnes logs in, then show picture X instead of picture, let me not say picture X, it should be, the other one should be picture X, right? <laughs> Dr. Barnes logs in, show her picture F for flowers, right? And if not, then show picture X for everybody else. We don't actually want the picture happening here, right? But we can't prevent it somewhere else. So my if then can say, okay, if Dr. Barnes logs in, show her this picture, it doesn't keep the rest of the code from showing her the picture, but at least right there, where I write my if-then, I want it to behave exactly how I expect. So I don't want anything to happen based on that if-then statement, um, if we're false at the beginning. Okay, so implication is the core of a whole lot of what we're going to do next, which is proofs that, so that we don't have to do long truth tables. But I'm going to uh, do one more thing before we move on to some logic proofs, which is um, we're going to give you an OR statement that is logically equivalent to this. So let me make a column for not P so that we can actually compare it with Q and OR everything together. So if I take not P and I OR it with Q in row 1, my not P or Q is going to preserve 1. So the two ones in not P are going to be preserved, and then the one in the last row for Q is going to be preserved, and I get the same function. This is called a logical equivalence when I have the same column in the truth table for two different functions. That means that I can substitute in. Whenever I see a P and plus Q, I can use not P or Q. So the way I usually write that is by having another column with a logical implication sign in it, which is too squished up. I'm going to make another one over here. And I'll number these columns. So this is going to tell me, are 1 and 2 the same? So this operator is called logical equivalence. And it means that those two um, variables have the same value in the same row. So if I look row by row, 1 and 2, they do have the same value. 1 and 2 do have the same value in row 2 and in row 3 and in row 4. So I get all 1s underneath that. Now, ideally, I always get all 1s underneath this symbol, and I'm supposed to. But I need to check it and make sure that the rest of my truth table is correct. So if I want to prove two things are equal, like you're given a homework, prove two things are equal given uh, with the truth table, then you can assume that you're going to have a column that looks like that, but you should make sure that your other columns actually do match. So this is considered a proof that these two functions are logically equivalent, so whenever I see one, I can use the other one. Why is that useful? Yeah, if I'm making circuits or I might have um, a chip that does one thing and I want to use it for something else, if I can show that I can sub it in, then I can use that chip instead. So I might not have, I might not have something that does P implies Q, but I might have OR gates and NOT gates. So I want to be able to do that. And I also want to be able to go from OR into implication because human logic works more with P implies Q. That is why it's the foundation of artificial intelligence because it is one of the foundations of human intelligence. 
So because that's the basic form of a rule, right? If you play any games at all, all almost all rules are if then. Yeah, so this arrow with two heads is called the logical equivalence. And it is based on the operator, um, which is called biconditional, which I... It's also called if and only if. You've probably seen your math professors write that. Anybody seen that? Yeah, they write this stuff all the time, okay? It means the same thing as equals, right? Now, if it has two bars, you're claiming that it's always true. Just like when we have a regular equals, right? We're claiming that the left side's equal to the right side. And in logic, so this, these two arrows mean like it's in logic and I'm claiming the left hand equals the right side. In this one, I'm claiming like two numbers are equal, right? If this one, if we have this one, all I'm doing is saying, check and see if they are equal. Sometimes they might be and sometimes they might not. So let's do the truth table for the biconditional. All right, so is P the same as Q in the first row? Yes. Second row? No. Third row? Fourth row? Yes. We have another function called P exclusive or Q, which we mentioned on day one when we're talking about or in English. So remember we talked about if I say you can have cake or ice cream, in some cases you can have one, right, or the other, but not both. And in some cases you can have both, right? So let's do the truth table for P exclusive or so another way we write it is XOR or exclusive OR. So this means P is true or Q is true, but not both. So in the first row, we have a zero. In the second row, P is false and Q is true, so that satisfies it. In the third row, P is true, so that satisfies it. In the fourth row, both of them are true, so I don't get a one because I have both. How do these two functions compare? They're opposites. So I could put a parenthesis around this and do a not and make a new function, which would be 1, 0, 0, 1, and that is logically equivalent to the biconditional. By the way, this is my cheap method for doing a quicker truth table. Technically, I should have made a whole other column and copied that over. But I'm lazy. Also, every chance you rewrite something, every time you rewrite something that's the same, you have a chance of making an error. So try not to rewrite stuff. You're allowed to put dittos on your test paper. For real. You may also make up your own variables and set them to things and then use them everywhere and then sub them back in at the end. You're allowed to do anything reasonable. Uh, with that in mind, though, <laughs> with that in mind, <laughs> with that in mind, um, I want to remind you of something that maybe you don't know, hopefully you do know, that when your TAs are grading your papers, they're going to have a key that I made. And it's going to be the way I do stuff in class. So you may be magically brilliant, and you might have math answers up here in your brain. That happens to some people, most of us not, but it does happen to some people or maybe it doesn't and you're just embarrassed about your chicken scratch and you only just put the final answer on your paper. But um, 
If you do things the way I've taught you in class, you will get maximal credit. If you don't, and it's still correct, you still might not get the credit. The, the reason is that when your TAs are grading, they're rate grading 190 papers. No, 290 papers. So that's a lot of papers. They're probably going to have their brains not working, and they're going to say, this doesn't look like the key, so it's wrong. Is that a problem? No, because you can just bring it to office hours and get it fixed. Do you want to do that? No. So do it the way you're supposed to do it. You can do other ways, and it's perfectly legal and fine. But if it's too wonky, you're probably going to have to have it rechecked. So just keep that in mind. So we love innovation, but we also want you to learn to follow rules and do things the way that we show you how to do them. So like when you're doing a truth table, you always have to write all the inputs, and you need to put them in the canonical order. You will lose points if you don't. So that's part of what you're in here to do, is learn how people write stuff down and how we do truth table proofs. And a proof means I have to show step by step every single thing, like all the different cases, and make sure that they're all true. So um, just keep that in mind. So I actually meant to say happy graders make happy grades. So that's how you remember that little spiel I just gave you, which is if your grader is happy, your grade is happy. OK, so implication. What's, why is, what's the big deal with that? Why is it such a big deal? The reason is that we use it a lot for reasoning. So now let me just ask you a question. If I tell you if it rains, you're going to get wet, and then I tell you it's raining, do you know anything? You're getting wet, right? Assuming I didn't lie, so if both of those previous statements were true, then we can conclude that Q must be happening. So if P is true, and I know that P implies Q is true, then I actually know that Q is true. OK, so we're going to prove this. So if it's raining, I'm getting wet. So this is an implication. So it always has the same truth table, which is 0 only in the case where P is true and Q is false. And then P is just our regular value. So we're going to put in the values for that. And Q is just what it is. So by the way, let's mark which ones we can do uh, first. So we can fill out all the things I'm going to mark with 1. They don't depend on each other, right? Well, they do, but as soon as I fill out my inputs, I can do all the rest of those without any interaction. But I can't do the AND until I do the P implies Q and the P columns, right? Because I'm ANDing those two things together. So let's do it now. So that's another thing I can do. So if I AND P implies Q with P, I get 0. I AND 1 or 0, I get 0. I AND 0 or 1, I get 0. And if I end 1 and 1, I get a 1. OK, so if we know P implies Q and we know P, then we know Q is true. So I didn't put an arrow both ways here because, actually, we need to check to see if it goes both ways. Like, are these equal? So it's not going to go both ways. But we want to check to see is, so I'm going to number these. So this is going to be A and B. So we're going to check, does A imply B? So A implies B is going to be true when? As long as, as long as we either have A as false, right, or B as true. So we can check for that. So we're going to look in the A column, row 1. 0 implies 0. That's true, right? Because A is false. So we've got A is false in three rows. And then the last one, A is true, so B better be true. So with implication, we check it the same way we check ands and ors. Pairwise, we look at the left one and see does it imply the second one. If it does, then we put a 1 in this column. Yes. That's so, okay. So what you did is you start with the two and then the canonical order. Those are always going to be the same. Um, the, uh, the, the traditional P and Q 
That's fine. It is conditional. That's always, that's always the same. That's always the one that you want. Yes, it is. And then P is just your copying of the original. Right. So if you're saying that in the, in the and, you're saying you're taking the and in between the P conditional Q and the P. Yes. So let me repeat that so in case people can't hear in the back. So what we did is I was just writing out a statement of P implies Q anded with P. I just want to see what the truth value of that is. So we can do anything we want in the truth table. We can write out something and want to see when it is true and when it's false. So we write P implies Q. We wrote P. We end them together. Then we just calculate those. It's all automatic. We're not thinking at all. Like once we wrote this out, we're just calculating. The thing you shouldn't be familiar with at all is this. So everything else should be easy except for this. So if you're lost with that, that's okay. I'm about to explain it some more. Okay? So what we're looking at is another kind of truth table proof. And I introduced it without telling you what I was going to do. Okay? So what we did is we're comparing two rows. So we want to see if I know these two things, do I know that one? So that's an if-then. I'm asking a question. If I know what happens on the left, do I know what happens on the right? And this column is the answer to that question. So this looks like an implication, right? But it's called a logical implication since it has two bars on it, and we want it to always be ones underneath. How many of you have seen math professors use this? You've seen them use it because they're deriving something from one line to the next, and they're basically saying that this thing implies that thing. And they're saying it's always true that it implies that. That's what we're using this truth table to prove. So when I make a truth table proof, and I want to prove a statement, implies another statement, I'm going to do this kind of table where what I'm going to do underneath this column is compare the left side and the right side and see is there an implication relationship between the left and the right. So if I know if it rains, I'm going to get it wet, I'm going to get wet, and I know it rains, that's like, so we have P is raining, and Q is getting wet. So if I know if it rains, I'm going to get wet, and I know it's raining, then I know that I'm getting wet. So we've just proved that using this truth table, because we have all ones under this implication. So let's talk about logical implication. Okay, so it's just like the logical equivalence we talked about before, except we want to claim that an implication is always true. So we make a truth table with it, and underneath it, we're checking to see if the left-hand side does imply the right-hand side in every single case. If it does, then we can have these double bars. And that means from now on, forever and ever, anytime I see what happens on the left, I can know that the stuff on the right happens. So just like an if-then in a program, that's true. Like it's a program, everything in a program is something true that we're going to do, and so if the condition and the if happens, then the conclusion, what happens inside that if is going to happen. Okay, so what we just proved is called, it has a name, and it's called modus ponens. So let's see how we write it down. So there's some funny Latin names for several of the things we're going to do, and we just proved it. So that's what we proved. I did these in the opposite order. I apologize. So we proved that if I know P and I know P implies Q, then I know Q is true. By the way, we've been using P and Q for all of our examples, but it doesn't matter if we switch to another variable letter. So the same thing will work as long as I make a substitution the same everywhere. So Modus ponens works no matter what because it's the pattern that we just proved, not anything about the particular variables. So it's not just that if it rains, you're going to get wet, and you know it's raining, you're getting wet. You actually know any time, if I know the if-then is true, and I know the hypothesis is true, then the conclusion must be true. If I know it's not raining, do I know anything about the conclusion? No. So we don't know anything if 
It's not raining. If I'm not wet, do I know anything about rain? Yes. Okay. So there's a, a cool thing. called contrapositive. So it actually has the same exact truth value. As P implies Q. So whenever I know P implies Q, then I know not Q implies not P. So what that says is, if it's raining, I'm getting wet, is the same as, logically equivalent to, if it's not raining, then, I'm sorry, if I'm not wet, then it must not have rained. Now, can it ever happen that if it doesn't rain, you get wet? Absolutely. There are people with buckets in the world. <laughs> there are a lot of buckets at my house and water guns and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, we know that there's other ways for things to happen. But, uh, so we have to be sure that we know what's going on with uh, implications. So when we have an implication, we can, since we know it's logically equivalent, we could actually reverse the order. So what I see this as doing is reverse the order of the implication and negate both sides. Uh, let's do a truth table proof for that. So every axiom we have, you can prove it with a truth table. And the axioms I'm referring to are on your axiom list, which is on your Moodle. Okay, and I'm going to do my not lazy way. Most of the time I'll be lazy, but we'll be not lazy today. Okay, so these I simply fill out based on um, P and Q. So I'm going to fill out not Q. It's going to be 1, 0, 1, 0. I'm going to fill out not P. It's going to be 1, 1, 0, 0. By the way, I am trying to say everything I'm writing. Um, so we do have uh, some people, you know, might be harder for them to see or, or hear or different things. So I'm trying to write and say everything all the time. Um, so we want to figure out, does Q imply P? So we look row by row. Does 1 imply a 1? Yes. Does 0 imply a 1? Yes. Does 1 imply a 0? No. You didn't get your million dollars. Does 0 imply 0? Yes. Oh, good. They're the same. And that's my proof for contrapositive. Any questions so far? We're going to do a couple of other rules that are really useful. <clears throat> one really useful one for engineers is to turn ands into ors. Does anybody know why that is really useful? So we can use one set of logic gates. So I can just have ands and nots, and I don't need any ors or vice versa. I can use ors and nots, or nors and ors, and I don't need any ands, vice versa. So that's called De Morgan's Law. It has two forms. Okay, so let's figure out P or Q first. P or Q is 0, 1, 1, 1. So the opposite of P or Q is 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, and we worked with this function 1, 0, 0, 0 earlier today. Does anybody know what it is? It's an and of not P and not Q. And we're proving, we're showing that these two things have the same value with this logical implication, and they do because they're the same in every row. So therefore, if I negate an or, I can change it into an and as long as I flip both of the variables as well.
The exact same thing happens if I negate an and. So if I negate an or, I get an and. If I negate an and, I get an or. So the way that works is I can negate P and Q, and it's going to give me not P or not Q. So it's going to negate, negate both of the variables and switch the and into an or. So we do and, P and Q. We negate it. We get 1, 1, 1, 0. And that is going to be the same function over here, which you can figure out yourself. And then those two things are logically equivalent. This is my lazy method. I don't rewrite. You can just read across there to see the title of that one. Yes, you may use the lazy method. Yes. Yeah, we'll do it some more. So the question was, logical equivalence is easy. This logical implication mess is a mess. So let's do it. Okay, so when we're talking about um, creating new knowledge, what we need to do is understand that we can't know everything about everything all the time. But we can know some things like if-thens. And I want to sometimes be able to derive new things. Now let's go back and look at our uh, modus ponens problem again. So here's the function we had. Actually, instead of doing that, I'm going to do, I'll look at both directions. So let's see, does that, which way do the implications go? Okay, so we already filled out going from left to right. So 0 implies a 0, 0 implies a 1 is true, 0 implies a 0 is true, 1 implies a 1 is true. If we look at Q implies, P implies Q and P, so this is going to be 1 implies 2, and that's going to be 2 implies 1. Okay, so if I'm looking for 2 implies 1, does 0 imply 0? Yes. Does 1 imply 0? No. Does 0 imply 0? Yes. Does 1 imply 1? Yes. So there's actually a case in this truth table where if I start from the right-hand side, I cannot derive the left-hand side. So just because I know that I got wet does not mean that it was raining. So that's why this is a logical implication instead of a logical equivalence because the 1 implies the 2, but the 2 does not imply the 1. So the bidirectional operator is actually the same as an implication going both ways, and it together. So if P is the same as Q, then P implies Q is true, and Q implies P, which you would write like that. Yes? So when the double bar look like an equal sign, you're saying it's always That's the right. Right. Just a single bar that might be a situation That's right. So I can put a double bar on this one because there's all ones underneath it, but I cannot put it on this one because there is not. So a log this one is a logical implication. That's just a simple implication. Logical implication means it has to be always true. Okay, so we actually know some other stuff. So we use this kind of logic all the time. This is sort of the basis of all of human intelligence, like I said. So for example... We know some stuff in regular math, like if x is less than y and y is less than z, what do you know? x is less than z. Does anybody know what that's called? Transitive. Okay. Now, what if I put a less than or equal to on there? It's still less than or equal to, right? So less than and less than or equal to are all transitive. So that means if I know two relationships and the conclusion of one is the same as the hypothesis of the other, it's going to be there. So actually less than or equal to is the same as implication. 
So P implies Q, another way you can remember it is the same in logic as P is less than or equal to Q. So what that's saying is Q is a true at least as often as P is. Okay, so we can do from the same math rule, if these are the same, then we actually should be able to do transitive with implication, right? So if I know P implies Q, and we know that Q implies R, what can I get? P implies R. Now, if I know P implies R, can I get these other two? No, so another way I like to think about this is flights, because these kind of look like diagrams for flights, right? So if I can fly from Paris to Quebec and Quebec to Raleigh, that means I can fly from Paris to Raleigh, right? But just because I can fly from Paris to Raleigh doesn't mean necessarily that I can go through Quebec to do it, right? So this implication only goes from left to right. So when I'm going from left to right, I'm losing information, right? I'm learning a new fact, but it's not telling me as much stuff about individual things in the world. So I'm going to try to give you lots of analogies for each thing that we do and have them make sense to you, connect it to something that already makes sense to you. So most of the math we're doing in here, you've actually already done it in some form or another, just with some regular numbers, not binary numbers. Okay, this is called, it, it should be called transitive, but it has another name, which is hypothetical syllogism. Now, I, I'm okay with being lazy, so you can write HS. But you should still know what we're talking about when we say the words out. Hypothetical syllogism. Okay, so we can prove this with a truth table. Does anybody want to? No, it's easy. Truth tables are easy, right? You just fill them out. Like, whatever values you can, you fill them out. And then you just look for ones in columns that have these double, double arrows. That's it. They're easy to do. Okay? All right, so why are we doing all this mess? We're doing all this mess because we want to do formal proofs. So formal proofs are where we actually can logic through, reason through some things, and derive new things. So these are proofs that use the axioms. to derive a conclusion from a hypothesis. Is this related to any operation that we have talked about today? It's related to implication. So when we prove things, we're actually proving an implication. So what we usually have is something like this. H implies C, where H is my hypothesis, and C is my conclusion, and I have a double bar here, which means that as long as I know H is true, then C has to be true. So as long as the hypothesis is true, the conclusion has to be true. But we have to prove it somehow. So it is our job, so this is a really core computer science um, idea, is that whenever it's your job to prove something, you should think of having an adversary that's going to try to poke holes in whatever you do. And truth tables are one thing you can't poke holes in. As long as you've filled out all the values, like there's no, there's no magic that's going to happen and flip one of the values in there, okay? So that's like a table. Here's all the, t this is a table of everything that could happen with P and Q and all the outputs. There's no, there's no arguing with it. You can't argue with it. Same thing, you want to do a formal proof in that way. There's no arguing with it. Why would we want that as computer scientists? What'd you say? We want to test all cases. Okay, what else? I want to make sure people can't break my programs. I do. How many of you people are not worried about your programs getting broken? Okay, you're not worried. Okay. How many of you know that airplanes are flown by computers? How many of you would like them to break? <laughs> like them to break. You don't fly, do you? Okay. When we're writing super important code, we have to prove that it's going to do what we say. So proofs is an integral part of doing computer science. You may not do it all the time, but you have to know how to do it, and you have to know how important it is, because human lives depend on these things working the way we say they do. 
So we often have to, when we have super important programs that have responsibility for people, we have to make sure they work the way they're supposed to. And so one way we do that is by proving that they do what we say. How do we do that? Well, we're going to do basic easy proofs now. Um, we're not going to do super hard proofs about like how complex code does what it does. You can take a whole class on that. Um, so we're not going to do it. <laughs> but that's the reason why we do this kind of stuff. And it's also because this is the core, like I said, of when we build software that tries to simulate how people reason, this is the core idea of it. So that software uses if-then rules all the time. OK, so what do we do? I might give you something like A implies B and B implies C and A as some givens. So I might write a problem like this, and I might say prove C. So these three things are given, and I'm going to prove C. Now, in a proof, if things are given, we assume a little and in between all of them. So A implies B is true, and B implies C is true, and A is true. So by writing it, simply writing it, I'm claiming that it's true. Now, I, I'm not claiming this is true, so it's kind of like I have a little question mark over it. So I want to show that C is true, but I don't know yet. So when I'm given a problem like this, then I'm going to write it down in what's called a formal proof. So I'm going to copy over the givens, and I'm going to put numbers next to them, and I'm going to write down that they're given. And up at the top, I'm going to write what I'm trying to prove because I don't want to forget. So we always have numbers, we always have statements, we always have a reason. And this is just a note, but we do have it at the top just to remember what we're doing. Now doing proofs is not always intuitive, but there's some easy stuff we can do. We can do some pattern matching. What I like to do is look at what I'm trying to prove and find it in my proof. I see it on line two, right? But line two has some other mess on there. I don't want it. I need to get rid of it. So I need to find a rule that actually helps me get rid of it. Well, we actually just talked about one, right? So I can get rid of this B if I had another implication that implied B. Oh, I do. So I've got A implies B and B implies C, so I can get A implies C from 1 and 2 and hypothetical syllogism. Any questions about that? So that's great. I got rid of the B. Oh, no. I still have an A there. I would like to get rid of that. OK? Well, handily enough, we have an A on line 3. If I combine it with line 4, what do I get? I get C because if I have A and plus C, that's like if it's raining, I'm getting wet. And line 3 says it's raining, so therefore I must be getting wet. That is modus ponens. So another thing we're doing here is every time we use a line from my proof, we're giving it a number in the reason, and then we're saying what rule we use, what axiom that's on your list that we use to derive that. So we wrote out modus ponens differently on a line before, yes. Yes, it's uh, a handout on your Moodle, and when you have a test, we will give it to you. However, you're going to be um, using them a lot, so you probably won't need it, but it'll be good just to be able to look at it. So you are allowed that. We give it to you during the test. You don't even have to bring it. Okay? Um, so I don't recommend, while you're doing proofs, to just look at your list of stuff that you're trying to prove. Like, you know, when I'm sitting here with this, don't look at the list. I think you should make a wish. So I have a double math major as undergrad and as a grad student. So I'm in uh, master's. I have a master's in math and undergrad in math, and also in computer science. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is that learning proofs was torturous. And it's, it's torturous for everybody. So don't think that when you're doing the, like this was the easy one, you're going to do some harder ones, OK? You're going to do quite a lot of harder ones. And you're going to be like, oh my goodness, what do I do? What you do is you make a wish for what you would like, 
and then you see if you can make that happen. So that's what I did. So I looked for what I was trying to prove. I was like, mm, I'm going to wish that C is somewhere in this list of givens. Because if it was already there, I wouldn't have to do anything, right? OK, well, I found the closest I could. And then I made a wish that this B would go away. And then I looked for a place where I might be able to make B go away. The only way I really can get it to go away is by finding its opposite and canceling it out, basically. Right? And that's what we did when we did our, our transitive rule, like when x is less than y is less than z, we kind of get rid of that y when we go to x is less than z. We're doing the same thing with hypothetical syllogism. We're getting rid of a variable. That's what we wanted. So we make a wish, and then we try to fulfill that wish with the rules that we have. And we do this with writing programs, too, don't we? Right? Like, we make a wish. I wish I had a function that would print out all the values in this list. Oh, yay, there's already one in here. Or, oh, no, there isn't. I have to write it. OK? So we do this all the time. You already do it. You just might have not have done it for logic. But you're doing it for writing programs. Um, and this is really good practice for this. So we're going to do some other problems like this. We talked about, so the rules we talked about today were implication rule, although I didn't actually necessarily write it that way. So what that means is whenever I see P implies Q, I can replace it with not P or Q. We did modus ponens, which was P, ended with P implies Q, logically implies Q. We did hypothetical syllogism. By the way, the word syllogism just means like truism. It means something that's true. So it's the thing that's true about statements with hypotheses. OK, so that's if you have P implies Q and Q implies R, then that gives you P implies R. This is probably going to be your favorite. And it shouldn't be your favorite. OK? Disjunctive syllogism says, if I have not P or Q, actually, it says if I have P or Q. It doesn't have a not on there, sorry. It says, if I have P or Q and I have not P, then what do I get? So if I tell you I have an apple or an orange, and then I say I don't have an orange, I must have an apple. So if I have an or, and I know one of the parts of the or is false, then the other part has to be true because or preserves truths, right? So there has to be a true in the source. So we must know that Q is true. So this is called disjunctive syllogism. And the reason why I say it shouldn't be your favorite is because it's not as useful as the ones that have implications in them. Because we're also sometimes going to have to use the hairy and yucky distributive rule if you insist on using disjunctive syllogism. So I'm going to write it down, and then we're going to stop. So just Distributive rule There's two of them OK, now, I really don't like this one. I don't like it because it's so easy to mix it all up. Now, the way to remember it, though, is that it works exactly the same way as regular math for one of the cases, where we think of or as plus and we think of and as times. So which ones of these works like you would expect? Anybody look at that and figure it out? OK, so if we translate this into math, that would be the first one would be PQ plus R equals P plus R times Q plus R. That doesn't look right to me. That's not regular math. Because you have to use first, inner, outer, last. You're going to get R squared in there. Right? This is not regular math. The second one, let's write that. P plus Q times R 
logically equivalent to PR plus QR. Hey, that works like I expect it to. So distributive, when you have the and on the outside, works just like your regular math. Um, and it works the same way for and and or. It's because we don't have order of operation in logic, but we do in regular math. So times always comes first in regular math, which is why this is false. Okay, But in logic, whatever the parentheses say is what you do. All right, so um, just to remember, help you remember it, you take the first, if I'm going to distribute an operator across a parentheses, you always, what you distribute ends up across, so the and r is going to be everywhere, and you just take the other ones. So you take the first variable and put it with and r, you take the second variable and put it with and r, and put that operator in the middle. See you next time. What say? That's right.